Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Once again, welcome, wildlings. Pop quiz, hotshot. You're in the middle of the woods. Your significant other has lured you out here and tried to off you. Oh, and people have been disappearing around here. Mostly your friends. What do you do? We'll be looking over one person's answer to that question tonight in the conclusion of Return to Pennsylvania. That would be parts three and four. By Rinskaro 13. Her footsteps made crunching noises in the snow as she approached me. Struggling to balance, I tried to focus on holding my neck together as well as my escape. Then, the crunching noises were followed by a loud thud as they stopped abruptly. Turning around to briefly take in a glance, it was clear that she'd fallen after tripping over a branch. A confused expression crossed her face as she tried to lift herself up again, but kept on sliding back down into the ground. It, it was a while before I noticed that her left foot was embedded in the ground up to her ankle, surrounded by a small pile of what looked like yellow powder, similar in appearance to an anthill. I could make out several small dots on her leg as she tried to pull it out of the ground. Her ankle was now completely surrounded by the strange grainy mound and became less visible in the moonlight. As I noticed the small dots on her trouser leg began to move, I heard her scream. They began to look like a column of small bugs, and as I edged slightly closer I could tell they were spider-like creatures, using their long stringy legs to scuttle around. They appeared from the mound in huge groups, crawling up her leg and into her coat as she desperately tried to yank her foot from the heap. Soon though, she fell to the ground and her screaming ceased as her body was covered with the creatures. Then she began to convulse as she moaned, writhing to and fro. Afterwards, I almost fell over again as I saw one of her arms dislocate outward with a sickening pop. Her hair began to fall out rapidly, and I could make out a pinkish tone within her skin as her flesh began to dissolve and shrink around her bones. Her other arm followed by a leg twisted away from her body as her eyes began to jut out of her skull from the effect of her tightened facial skin. As I was forced to visually piece each aspect together in my mind, I recognized the image that I was seeing. It was the same image that had been in my head as I read the diary entry of the missing girl as she was describing the creature that she'd seen. My girlfriend was turning into this grotesque humanoid creature. Whatever those spiders were, they must have had some kind of venom, mutagen, something which affected her body and her brain. Either that or they simply entered her body and rebuilt it themselves. Gradually digesting my thoughts, my mind turned to the girl's diary entry that I had read not that long ago. She was in a similar situation to myself, standing a few feet from a potentially lethal uh, spider cannibal, she had called them. What had she decided to do? She had decided to climb up a tree. I was in a totally unfit state to do that, so I tried to keep thinking of different possibilities of escape. Edging away, I noticed that some of the tiny spider-like creatures had crawled over closer to me and had tried to crawl up my leg. There was no time to waste. I stumbled forwards as fast as I could, heading for the city on the other side of the forest. The lampposts shone and I could make out blurry light suggesting that I was closer to safety. And then out of the blue, I felt an immense, powerful burning in my legs. It was so irritating and painful that I, I needed to scratch the feeling off, but I forced my legs to continue carrying the burden of my weight. I knew the pain I felt had to be the result of the spiders and their venom injecting it into my veins, but I had to keep going. I'd only been bitten maybe a few times, and if I stopped, I'd be enveloped in those things and all of their bites would turn me into one of those cannibals. If I made my way to the city, surely there would be someone in a house or a 
building. Of course, the area was so remote that the chance of someone actually being there for me would be slim, but I had to get there first to have any chance of surviving until tomorrow. It seemed so far away. Looking back over my shoulder momentarily, I saw my girlfriend's body twitch and writhe as her flesh continued to dissolve and her body continued to change. Her hideous form lifted itself upright and started to crawl on all fours, uncomfortably adjusting to the new change in position. Sniffing the air, her eyes turned to meet mine, and that's when I started to panic. Racing down the frozen path, I clutched my neck tightly as I dodged through trees and jumped over branches, pursued by the most terrifying sight that I'd ever seen. I guess my haste simply got the better of me as I crashed head-on into a river. The strange thing was I hadn't even tripped over anything, I'd just fallen from my carelessness. I swam to the surface of the water to gasp for air and to climb on to the bank, and as I moved a finger past the bloody dent on my neck. The wound was still deep, however, not as deep as I had first felt it. Also, I was glad that it was beginning to scab over. Turning my head to inspect my surroundings, I noticed that the spiders were gone, and so was my girlfriend's spider cannibal form. A foul stench began to rise from the water, and when I turned my head in the direction of the smell, I made out a body floating on the water's surface, as well as hearing a sizzling sound. It was enough to send me springing onto the bank and out of the river. Turning to face the body, I could tell that its limbs were still flailing. However, its motion slowly ceased, and it completely stilled. It was a close call. As luck would have it, my clumsiness had saved my life this time, or at least prolonged it for a while. I knew who and what it was instantly after looking at it. Her skin was reacting violently with the water. It had caused the temperature to rise, stripping her of the muscles and tendons underneath the skin. Her corpse was dissolving. A minute later, I felt a tear run down my face. Then, seeing the little spiders scuttle across the twisted arm of the corpse which lay on the bank, using it as a bridge, I quickly turned to escape. As I dashed to town, I couldn't help but think of how I'd finally lost everyone that I'd ever loved, even though I should have known that my girlfriend was gone years ago. My family was dead, many of my friends had gone missing, they were probably dead, and now my girlfriend Anne had been taken away from me, the final victim of this unfortunate death streak that seemed to follow me around. I thought about that kiss Anne had given me at the airport. It felt so passionate, so real, yet it was simply a distraction to try and take my attention away from the scars that she wanted so desperately to hide. That and trying to murder me, which I guess wasn't really her fault. An insane psychopath had taken over her body since she had died inside from the grief. And it was at least partially my fault for not being there to support her. Even if I survived all this, how could I live with myself knowing that I took part in causing my girlfriend's death? And then what would I do with my remaining 70 or so years of lonely life afterwards? The burning in my legs returned and I understood what was happening. Even though the spiders were far behind, the venom that they'd already injected into my legs had remained and would take effect soon, turning me into one of those cannibals. I too would soon be gone, whether I wanted it or not. Millions of tiny bugs had crawled onto Anne's body lying in the water and had started to eat away at the remaining flesh and bone. And then a thought hit me. The disappearances. 1998, the spiders must have first bitten several of the campers, causing them to contract the infection and turn into these creatures, killing off the other humans to provide carcasses for the spiders. After this, the remaining venom in their bodies would slowly kill them off, and the spiders would devour everything in sight, all of it dead. Assuming that 
my hypothesis was correct, these spiders must have been a very well-adapted species, which only appeared underground in a certain area of this forest and only in cold conditions. The teenagers hadn't disappeared. Their remains had simply been eaten by these tiny, malicious insects. If only my phone had battery left, then I might have been able to call the police if the signal was strong enough. Cursing my misfortune, I turned around and ventured on with all my strength, weeping out loud. After all, I could do little else. I finally made it into the empty city, where I collapsed and went unconscious. Sadly, it turned out that the city was, in fact, quite deserted, and not a single soul laid eyes on me that night. In the morning, I found myself lying in the grass. My head felt dizzy from blood loss, but I was glad that I'd made it and I hadn't died the previous night. It was then that I noticed my arms had bent slightly outwards and my heart started to race. I tried to pull them back inward to feel the wound on my neck, but they simply wouldn't bend that way. My legs were still fine, but the skin looked pink and raw and shriveling. I recognized several strands of brown medium length hair on the ground and my hips had sunken inwards creating a cavity where my stomach should have been. The venom was overtaking me. The poison was taking effect. To my delight, I kept surprisingly calm after a while. Since there were no spiders to dispose of my body, what would happen to me? Would I wander into the city, get shot? Would I simply die of the, the poison? I hoped that maybe one day a scientist would find my body and use it for research to save other lives instead of leaving me here to rot. So at the moment, I'm still feeling generally relaxed, but I can't deny that I'm still quite anxious. Will death hurt? Or will God take it easy on an innocent bloke like me? Even if I stay alive, I have nothing to live for. I have no family or friends, no career ahead of me. I'll never date another woman again. I'll never have children. I'll never do anything productive. I'd rather die than become a waste of space. I wish that I had sounded a bit more serious on our first date. I remember Anne once asked me, Jake, if you only had a single day left to live, what would you do? I don't know. Probably tell my family I love them, I guess, or try and meet someone famous, I responded. Well, I can't do either of those things now. Now I'm nobody. I'll die nobody. I wish I knew that earlier on. Then I would have simply committed suicide instead of suffering on this long. On another note, a man just walked by. How exciting. Okay, so maybe that's not the best answer. At least not the one I was looking for. Happens a lot, that. Even when we know that our questioning won't get us anything good, we press on. Funny, isn't it? Stay scary, wildlings. Leave the bugs alone and make the most of your nights.